Greetings, everyone. This is Fred Coulter, and welcome to Church at Home. Church at Home is dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today, and it's going to be based on the truth of the Word of God. What does God say, Old Testament and New Testament? What is it that we are to do? And we'll also begin to examine the question concerning Christmas. Now, Christmas is one of the hardest things for people to understand that it's not from God. Yet, every year when you see a documentary on television, everybody knows that Christmas was not originally from the Bible. Yet it's such a thing that everyone gets caught up in it. And as we finish the last segment, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life are not from the Father. And if they're not from the Father, who are they from? And where does it come from? So today we're going to continue looking at what Jesus Christ says is the truth. And then we will see where the error comes from. Then we will examine and it may take us two or three segments to do so, all of the truth about Christmas. And I'm sure there will be some people be totally angry at it. And there will be some people knowing what the truth really, really is and what the Bible says, that they will not want to change their ways to follow God because they love what they're doing so much that they can't give it up. Because the deception of Christmas is so powerful that some people turn their back on the truth, walk away. See, because if you're against Christmas, gotta be a Scrooge. And don't they play that every year? The movie of Ebenezer Scrooge. Yes, the nasty little curmudgeon who wouldn't give a pittance to anyone. And supposedly the angels visited him, but they were demons. Gave him turmoil and trouble. And he finally repented. And gave things to people and walked in the street and said, Merry Christmas! Whereas before he said, bah, humbug. <laughs> and so if anyone is against Christmas, you got to be a Scrooge. See, well, let's frame it in the right way. As we have covered in the segments leading up to this, what is truth? And should not everything be examined by the truth? Now, we'll cover that in just a little bit, a little bit more. But let me read you Jeremiah 10 and verse 10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the everlasting King. That's who God is. Now, that is the one who became Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus said, that he was the way, not a way, the truth, and the life. So that tells us no one, as Jesus said, comes to the Father except through me. And it means that you have to walk in the way of God, in the truth of God, in order to receive eternal life and have blessings in this life. Now, there is, as we covered last time and we mentioned, but let's look at it. Let's come back here to Revelation 12, 9. Let's read this scripture because you see more lies are wrapped up in Christmas than any other Christianized pagan celebration in the world. It's an amazing thing. 
It's like I mentioned last time. You have lies over here. You have truth over here. And gradually by compromising and working together, you end up with true lies over here and lying truth over here. Oxymorons, right? I prefer to call them morioxons. They're so crazy. Now, if gradually things have changed, you know the old proverbial thing, put a frog in the water and gradually heat it up, and soon you'll cook it alive. And then it will die. But it won't recognize what is happening. But if you throw it instantly into the hot water, crip, it'll jump out. So what kind of frog are you, <laughs> if we could put it that way? How do you view life? How do you view these things? How do you view God? What is your standard for truth? What you believe, your opinions? Because you see, if you believe a lie, you believe a lie with the same intensity that you do the truth. Now here, Revelation 12, 9, it says, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, who is deceiving the whole world. And he's got a lot of help. Every modern technology is being used to preach the truth in a very little narrow band of comparison to all the lies. All the modern technology, radios, telephones, television, iPhones, iPads, Blackberries, Blueberries, Droids, as it is on the TV, okay? Computers, internet, television, cell phones. And most of it, if you take the Ten Commandments over here and start going through television channels, start going through ads, start looking at what is happening in the world, you're shocked. You really understand the Ten Commandments. And you have to ask the question, who is really practicing the truth? And we'll see about that in just a little bit. But remember, that ancient serpent brings the same lines. Oh, you can do this and live? Oh, you're smart. You're intelligent. Oh, yes. You can decide good and evil. So what does he persuade men to do? Let's see how he works. Let's come to Ephesians, the second chapter. Now, here's the state of the world. When the Apostle Paul wrote, wrote this, he didn't know that he was writing such a profound truth that in the end days it would be magnified millions of times over. But let's read it. Now, you were dead in trespasses and sins. All right. How's your life? Are you subject to death? Yes, indeed. All of us take our first breath when we're born, last breath when we're die. There's a time to be born, there's a time to die. And since man's inherent nature is sinful, and having the law of sin and death in us, we're nothing more than the walking dead. That's why Jesus said, he is life. And you've got to come through Christ. And you've got to come through the word of God, not how you may think that God wants you to be, but in truth, how God wants you to be. And remember this, no mortal man has the authority or the right to add anything to the word of God. You believe that? Well, Satan likes to do a lot of adding. And here's how he works in the world, in which you walked in times past, that is, before their conversion, according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working within the children of disobedience. That's the whole world. If the whole world is deceived, is there a spirit of Christmas that permeates everything? Oh, yes. The spirit of lust, the spirit of greed, the spirit of sales. Do you think people are merchandised during Christmas? Yeah, many weeks ahead of time, right? Yes, indeed. Friday after Thanksgiving, at midnight, they start opening the malls. And people run to buy the, the things. You think God is in that? Do you think God was in the trampling of some of the attendants at the doors of the malls because the people were so filled with lust and greed and selfishness that they stampeded their way through and ran over and trampled one of the attendants at the door? Oh, we do this for God. Really? Is that godly behavior? Oh, but we have such wonderful hymns and do such good things. Really? Are they really to God? Could it be? that these are so deceptive that you are lured and locked into it in such a way that you don't know right from wrong. And you think you're doing good because of the prince of the power of the air. Now notice, among whom also we all once had our conduct, in the lust of the flesh and the things willed by the flesh and by the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as the rest of the world. Now remember what we have covered. God is truth. God is love. God is grace. God is merciful. God is righteous. We're required to worship God in spirit and in truth. Can we serve God if we do our will? Or do we not have to do the will of God? Can we serve God to our lust and our own vain imaginations? Or do we have to repent and yield to God? What is it? Well, you have to repent and yield to God. Let's come back here to John the 8th chapter. And let's see what Jesus told the disciples that were following him. Those who were disciples of Jesus. So if you say, I'm a Christian. Question is not what you profess. The question is what you actually are. And if you are a Christian, do you believe God? I want you to stop and think about that phrase, believe God. I did not say, do you believe there is a God? Because James wrote, if you believe there is a God, you do well. The demons, that is Satan and the demons also believe and tremble in fear. To believe God means that you hear what God says and you obey. You go read Hebrews, the 11th chapter. That's the faith chapter. And it says, anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists. And that means not only his existence, but everything that he is and stands for. Okay. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, didn't we cover some of this in the other segments? Yes, indeed. Are you diligently seeking God? See? Then it says, by faith, Abel offered his offering. By faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Abraham believed God and followed him. So if you have faith, belief, what does that require? Good feeling in your heart? Joyous things in your mind? Or does it require action? Are we not to walk in the way of the Lord? And what is the way of the Lord? Whatever is defined in the Bible. So you see, in order to understand about Christmas and what it really, really is, 
we're going to peel everything back like stripping an onion away, and we're going to find that every time you peel some of this away, it is terrible. And there will be some people who are so in love and infatuated with Christmas that they don't care what God says. Is that you? So all of us are confronted with a question. Do we believe God or not? Do we believe the Bible or not? Do we love God and keep his commandments or not? What is it that we do and think and act? How are our lives in truth, you see? So when you peel back the facade of the public persona that you give to people, or that any of us give to anyone, who are we? What are we? God knows, and God judges the heart. A lot of people say, well, God knows my heart. Therefore, it really doesn't matter because I'm a good person. Well, God does know your heart, and he does say, that the carnal mind is enmity against God and not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So you see, it doesn't matter how pleasantly you express it. You're an enemy of God because you have followed people who have said, we don't need to worry about the Bible. We don't need to worry about God. We have the answers. We are wise. And then what happens? They exchange the truth of God for a lie. And they worship and serve the created thing more than they worship and serve God. As a matter of fact, they reject him. They don't even care about him. That's the education of this world. That's the world we've grown up in. Do you really, really really believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you really, really, really believe that you have to live by every word of God? Do you truly understand that we are to live by the words of Jesus Christ? So let's see what he told the Jews who were his disciples. This is what we need to know and understand, so that as we're going through these segments, and we'll end up by going through and showing all the lies about Christmas. But what I, what I want to do is help you examine every excuse that you and others give for not obeying God. And every excuse and delightful tidbit of wanting to keep Christmas because you think you are doing good. And is it not the height of deception to have someone so deceived that they think they're doing good? Let's see what Jesus said. Verse 23, he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. So you can't bring the things of the world and attach it to God's way, attach it to God's word, or Jesus Christ. And you can't take the ways of man under the deception of Satan the devil and say, Oh, Lord, look at what a wonderful thing that we have. Oh, listen to those beautiful hymns. How very clever to trick you. I mean, would you be deceived if it were the worst music that was ever heard? No, no. Beautiful, lovely. I just bet that you could start singing the Christmas hymns from heart, right? Because you've heard them so many times. But can you recite the Word of God from heart? Because you've read it and studied it so many times? Let's go on. That is why I say to you, you shall die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. And I am to those Jews was a very powerful statement because that identifies him as the I am in Exodus, the third chapter. 
I am that I am. So they knew that he was God manifested in the flesh. Then they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, the one that I said to you from the beginning. He let them know enough. He just told them who he was. I am. And that's interesting in the Greek because there are two, two Greek words for I am, and that is ego and emi. When they're put together, it is a double emphasis, meaning emphatically, I am. So that's why in the faithful version, we translate it in capital letters. Now continuing verse 26, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. God the Father is true. And Jesus came to reveal him. The Father was not revealed until Jesus came. And what I've heard from him, these things I speak to the world. See, and God the Father and Jesus Christ are one. And Jesus said, I preach the words and teach the words that the Father commanded me. What is that? Truth. Truth. Do you really love the truth? Now, I want you to think about that. I don't want you to say, oh, yes, I love the truth. But let me see what this guy's going to say here, because I'm, I'm going to trip him up on something. Okay, go ahead. That's fine. But notice verse 27, but they did not know that he was speaking to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you yourself shall know that I am and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father taught me, these things I speak. Not something? You read what Jesus is teaching. Where did that come from? God the Father, the sovereign of the universe, directly from him. Now, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? But are there some people who will reject that? Who will refuse to accept it? What about you? What will you reject and what will you accept? Will you accept lies? reject truth, or will you reject lies and accept truth? This is the question. Let's go on. Verse 29, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone because I always do the things that please him. Think about that. Always do the things that please him. You want to know something not once in the Gospels. Is there anything mentioned about celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ? Yes, it tells us when Jesus was born. So you download the article, when was Jesus born? Because it was not on December 25th. And all the experts know it. There is not one that does not know that. So the question becomes, if you know that it wasn't on December the 25th, and you know that Jesus never kept or celebrated his birthday, and you know that nowhere in the New Testament does it say that we should, and you know that the practice did not weave its way into the churches until 300 years later, longer than the history of the United States of America. That's how long it took for Satan the devil to weave it into the church. Now, we'll talk about some of those, and we'll read some of those facts a little bit later. But we need to understand, when you're confronted with truth, what are you going to do? Ask yourself this question. What am I going to do when confronted with the truth? Are you going to accept the truth and shed the lies? Are you going to come out from underneath the deception and follow God? Are you going to want to keep the things that God says where he will bless you, watch over you, 
and care for you? You can find favor and grace in his eyes? Or are you going to go in your own way? See, this is a vital thing, absolutely necessary. This is why we have church at home. Because you're not going to hear these things from the pulpits of Sunday-keeping churches. Because you see, Sunday, as we've covered in the Sabbath series, is not the day that God the Father of Jesus Christ ever established. So to begin with, they're practicing a lie. Then they add to it many other lies in their own self-righteousness. And it all comes from Satan the devil. And we'll see that here in a little bit. We need to really examine these things carefully. So once again, thank you for inviting me into your home. And this is Fred Colder saying, be sure and visit our other website, cbcg.org. So until next time, so long, everyone.